All right, good afternoon. Yeah, so I'm Dave Isles. Hopefully you guys can hear me all right. I'm not too loud. Uh, so I'm going to talk about kind of connecting VM and container clouds with bare metal server clouds. Or another way of putting it is connecting your software-defined network with your hardware-defined network. So let's uh, talk a little bit about how we got here. So anybody that's been doing uh, OpenStack for a while, you're probably familiar with kind of the way people used to deploy things. People would deploy a new workload, and you'd have to make sure that the right uh, VMs uh, had the right VLANs assigned, and all of the switches had the right uh, VLANs assigned throughout the network. So you'd have maybe uh, Neutron plug in the top of racks, the, the ones above it. And if for something went wrong, if you deployed a new workload and the, virtual the VLAN wasn't configured right, well, things would just break. At some point, people figured out, you know what, there's, there's not enough scale with VLANs. They'd like to have more, more, more scale. They'd like to have more flexibility. And they'd also like to move a lot of the programmability, make it purely software. And so they created this kind of overlay technology, which solved a number of problems. One of the best things that did, though, was provide this kind of um, simplification of the underlay. It meant that instead of having to change things every time I deployed a new workload, I could leave the physical infrastructure kind of static. And that meant, you know, it also meant that kind of the virtual machines could move around the data center. I wasn't tied to one rack or another rack. And um, I had a lot more scale. But the, that idea that the, the changes, instead of going into the physical network, into the, this overlay network, it kind of changed things for the underlay, too. So if you think about the underlay, where before I had to have uh, maybe a VLAN in the same racks if I wanted a customer to have um, virtual machines in one rack and another rack. When you went to this overlay technology, it meant that all the changes happened up in this uh, software-defined. And the physical infrastructure could stay basically static. It meant that as I added a new workload, I didn't have to add a new VLAN necessarily to the physical infrastructure. In fact, the other thing it made is, was, I don't know, I don't know if you ever noticed, but um, there's a lot less change going on there. And so as soon as something goes wrong with your data center network, what's the first thing you do? You see what changed. Who made a configuration change? In fact, there's good business just in keeping logs and keeping action of who changed what, when, log it, so that you can go back and say, ah, that's why things broke. So people really like this idea of the physical network staying pretty static and actually became more uh, stable by doing that. But also said, you know what, this frees us to kind of make the uh, layer two domains even smaller. And for guys that are in networking, layer two domain is synonymous with fault domain, right? The bigger my layer two domain is, that's the bigger that some jabbering nick or some malfunctioning thing can bring down everyone else. So going to layer three and making them smaller makes it, uh, makes it nicer. So that also lets us do a few other things. So I show here kind of a scale-up networking. So um, it's kind of the old approach to networking. But you kind of needed it back in the day in some ways just because you wanted to have that VLAN in, say, rack one, and you also wanted it in rack 30. And so what were you to do? You almost had to have a big old-school modular switch, uh, you know, and pay the cost in terms of uh, uh, price per port, in terms of power consumption, in terms of just the, um, that old school way of doing things, right? So if you do scale out storage, right, you're doing Hadoop, you're doing Ceph, you're doing SAP HANA, no, people aren't using the scale up approach as much anymore, except for their network. Well, going to this idea that now, actually, my top of rack switches can be layer three, well, then it starts saying, well, why do I even need a big modular switch there? With, if everything's layer three, except for the overlay, well, then that means that I can use these very small, inexpensive switches. And this is how, of course, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Uber, you name it. When they build a data center, they only use the big modular switches in the, where they have to use them. And that's how most of the industry is moving to. And part of that is this move to layer three and small fault domains. Um, part of it is you kind of get to use, uh, you know, th this idea that instead of when I have to upgrade one switch, normally you have to take down half your network. Well, if you have leaf and spine, you take down one of those switches, you've lost a third or a quarter or maybe one eighth of the network. And if I need to grow, instead of saying, well, I went from a 256 port chassis to a 512 port chassis, you can go, you know, actually go from three spine switches to four spine switches. So it scales very linearly. And we see the industry kind of moving this way too. So it's not just, hey, people talking about it, but for the last 10 years, people have been buying a lot less modular switches. Everyone's buying fixed port switches and using them in, the, uh, in places they never used them before. And this fits with this model of software-defined networking. So a lot of cost advantages of that. But you know, there's no free lunch. So when you start doing software-defined networking, 
one of the things you do is you end up paying a lot more of your um, server CPU power in just moving packets. Part of it is the overhead of just tunneling, right? So when you're doing VXLAN, you're doing tunneling, uh, that makes sense, right? That you, you've got to do that work. But the other thing that people don't catch is that for the last, you know, 20 years, we've been adding little cool um, offloads, IP checksum offloads, TCP checksum offloads. Those are all things that the cheapest NIC in the world offers so that your C CPU on your server doesn't have to do. But as soon as you start tunneling, you've said, oh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all those checksums before I even hand it to the NIC. And so then you've, you kind of have a double whammy when you start doing these over offloads. So you need NICs that can kind of improve the performance and get the CPU power back. So you could burn up half of the CPU power on your server just packaging and moving packets around. And if you have good offloads on your NIC, that allows you to kind of take those cores back for what you bought the server to do in the first place. So good NICs with good VXLAN offloads are pretty important for that kind of software-defined VM cloud. The other thing is, you know, so some people use um, you know, Linux bridge, some people use OV, OVS, depending on how, you know, complicated, what kind of cult controls you want. So, or if, even if you're doing some like NFV applications, people are really into kind of uh, accelerating their servers. And so we make, you know, arguably the, the highest performing uh, DPDK, hopefully you guys know what DPDK is, but it's a way of kind of accelerating, using the NIC to um, uh, accelerate your servers. But the other thing that we're seeing, though, is this say, if you are adopting OVS, you can offload that whole OVS right to the NIC. And so you get, again, this idea that you get some benefit from DBDK, but you actually get a full two cores back it moving to a full OVS offload. So that's kind of the, the NIC side of the equation on software-defined networks, where you have to have good hardware hooks to, to pull it off. But if you look at this new Ironic with um, uh, OpenStack, where there's now support for doing bare metal servers. And so some customers, they like bare metal servers. If you look at uh, uh, SoftLayer, they got their start mostly just doing bare metal servers. Rackspace, bare metal servers. It's, uh, even Oracle has bare metal cloud. I mean, it's, it's uh, some people either they feel their workloads need it, or they want to install their own hypervisors on a bare metal server that they control. Either way, there's this idea that as you deploy these bare metal servers, the networking kind of is is no longer yours to control on that server. There's very little that you can do as a bare metal. In fact, with Ironic, they kind of expect the network is flat. And really, if you want to have multi-tenant isolation, if you wanted to kind of have things span from one part of the network to the, your, uh, another part, all that work that used to be done in V switches now need to be done in P switches, right? They got to be in, in uh, physical switches. And so you start looking at, well, what could you use for that technology? Well, you could use, if you remember, you know, uh, Trill. Anybody remember Trill? Right? So Trill was this promise. It was going to give you a VLAN anywhere in your data center. But what they were really kind of doing is giving you a really big layer 2 domain. And as we talked about earlier, a really big do uh, L2 domain is the same thing as a really big fault domain. And the other thing is, even though it was, quote, a standard, if you got Cisco's fabric path, which was Trill, it didn't work with anyone else's Trill. It didn't work if you got a brocade VCS that was Trill or Huawei's trill, or anyone else's trill. Everybody's trill was kind of, you know, in name only. So um, the right way to do this, as we've discovered just with the, the software um, SDNs, is to use VXLAN. But it, instead of having V switches do all the work, you'd like to have kind of all of that work done by the physical switches. And that way, if you have a customer and they've got a number of um, uh, applications, they want to be in the same network, you can span across layer three areas. So that brings us to eVPN. And this is something that's a, a standard-based approach. So if you think about how did people do the, the VXLANs for software-defined, usually you, you use a controller, you know, like NSX or uh, something like Nuage or Contrail, but at least you've got a centralized controller. And what that controller does is kind of responsible for almost two main things. One is um, it's got to let all the um, VTEPs know about all the other VTEPs, right? You say that's how they kind of discover each other. The controller tells them. And the second thing it does is it does address dissemination. It says, hey, um, all of the addresses, the MAC addresses, IP addresses behind those VTAPs, that's how I'll, the controller would tell you. So also with eVPN, we get away from controller. You can kind of think of it as a controller-free environment. And what we did was we said, you know, there's actually a pretty well-known way of disseminating addresses that the internet uses. 
it's called BGP, right? BGP scales infinitely, right? We have easily 600,000 routes that most uh, internet scale routers uh, have to support, and that's gonna be a million within a couple years. Really good at, at that. So eVPN is an extension of BGP, and it's standard space, so that the idea is that you can mix and match vendors. You can have Cisco up at the top, Mellanox at the bottom, you could have Arista at the top, Mellanox at the bottom, you could even have Juniper at the top, Mellanox at the bottom, right? <laughs> oh, you catch sets in a pattern there. Um, okay, uh, so it does a few of these things. It does a lot of that stuff that used to be done in a controller in a centralized way. So the other nice thing about controllers, as much as they're nice, they're also kind of like that chassis where it's, you know, 256 ports. It's like, well, we can do this many VTEPs, and if you want to do more, now i got to just double the controllers or triple the controllers. With uh, eVPN, you're kind of adding scalability as you add, you like control plane scalability as you add each new uh, node. Uh, the other thing is if you look at uh, the idea that, hey, I'd like to have a network that's connected from one of my racks in the data center to another rack in the data center. But what if that other rack wasn't in the same data center? What if that other rack was in another data center? And in fact, so the, one of the, the killer use cases for eVPN originally was, was not bare metal cloud, it was just data center interconnect. A standardized way of competing, instead of using proprietary like VPLS or some MPLS kind of VPNs, eVPN is almost purpose built for when you've got a colo site and you want to connect that colo site to your regular data center and you want it to look like it's in the same network, eVPN is perfect for that. Or a branch office or, you know, take your pick. So that's kind of this idea of, of um, EVP, eVPN. And this isn't meant to be a primer that gets into the announcement types and things like that. It's really meant to just show that if you are building a bare metal cloud, this is the new way of doing it. Because Cisco supports it, Juniper supports it, Mellanox supports it. It's the kind of the new way to do, um, answer the needs of, of what people used to say use Trill for. Have a VLAN anywhere in your network. But not all eVPNs are, are equal. So as much as I kind of said, well, before, hey, listen, they're, they're interoperable and you can mix and match and people don't want unicorns. Do you, anybody know what I mean when I say a, a unicorn? A unicorn is like this magical uh, beast that is irreplaceable and it's very expensive. People don't want those, right? They want, they want the functionality that's there to be common across multiple platforms so they're not locked into one vendor or another vendor. But what I'll say is you should expect a few things from your eVPN network. One is you shouldn't have to pay a special license to pixie boot the switch the same way you pixie boot your server. All right? You don't pay a special license on your servers to pixie boot. Well, your network has ZTP. You shouldn't have to pay a license for that. BGP, it's like saying, hey, I have a layer three switch and it doesn't do BGP. It's like, well then, what does it do? Because BGP is like the lingua franca, you know, it's the, the, the language of routing at this point. Uh, same thing for um, uh, VXLAN. You have VXLAN, it's, that's a, a table stakes feature and you shouldn't be paying licenses for it. VXLAN routing. So this is one where I think a lot of the early implementations of switches that got VXLAN on them, they could do VXLAN bridging, but they couldn't do VXLAN routing. And they, you guys might be thinking, well, what, where do I need that? So if you have a tenant, and he has two networks, two VLANs, and they want to like route traffic from one VLAN to the other VLAN, well, if you don't have VXLAN routing, let's go back to this other picture. If I want to connect and I've got two different servers. Maybe they're, maybe they're even the same top of rack switch. And they want to route to each other, but they happen to be in different VLANs. If you don't have VXLAN routing, you've got to trombone that traffic out of the VXLAN network into some firewall or router, and then it traverses all the way back through your, your underlay. So it's a very inefficient use of your bandwidth. And, and actually, that's actually what you want to do if you're going from one tenant to another tenant. You actually don't want, you want those policies that a firewall gives you. But if it's the same tenant, you want VXLAN routing. And so some people have ways of kind of tricking and making, using loopback cables to try to make it work. No, that's fine, it's a workaround. But really, you want a switch that does that. And, and you know, I would say a quarter of the switches out there have that in hardware. VTEP scale, I think it should be obvious. You know, if you, if you want a big data center that's using this, you have to have the hardware support for enough VTEPs. And a lot of them just top out at 128. And that's going to actually be more important as we talk about bridging between a, a, a software-defined network and a hardware-defined network. Because you can imagine every hypervisor has the potential of being a VTEP. 
it's not just top of rack switches as being the VTAPs. When you're doing VXLAN, every server is a VTAP. And if you have a max of 128 VTAPs that you can do head end replication to, that's a serious performance limitation. All right, in rack multi tenancy. So if you have two customers, two tenants, and you happen to put them there, maybe this is bare metal, and you, you have 48 servers in a rack or 40 servers in a rack, you don't sell all 40 servers to the same tenant. You might have one server going to one tenant, another going to a different tenant. And, but both of those tenants come to you and say, ah, I want to use VLAN 100. You go, well, we can't use 101? Like, no, 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 we want VLAN 100. Well, that's pretty common. So you'd like to be able to offer both of them VLAN 100. But in, mo in many implementations, the way they do is they, uh, they, they configure and say a kind of a global statement that says, on this switch, VLAN 100 equals VXLAN or VNI 200, right? And it's a static mapping. So you can't have two different customers using the same VLAN ID. So you really want that as a requirement. Again, it's one of those, should be a no-brainer, but uh, all right, Q in VXLAN. So hopefully you guys are familiar with Q and Q, but Q in VXLAN is a way of making your life easy in that if you've considered the idea of pseudo wire where, hey, I've got a port on this rack and it's connecting to another port on another rack and I don't want to have to configure every VLAN that a customer has, right? If I have a, uh, normally the way it works is um, if, I have, if a customer has 10 VLANs, I have to configure 10 VNI swarm. If they have 100 VLANs, I have to configure 100 VNI swarm. If I do Q and VXLAN, the customer doesn't know that I'm doing any Q and Q. They don't know. All they know is they have a port and whatever VLANs they put in on that port, it also shows up on any of the other ports that, are, that I've sold them. So Q and VXLAN is a, maybe a, more of a, a savings for you uh, having to administer this. All right, and then lastly is this idea of Rocky over VXLAN. So Rocky is um, you know, RDMA over converged Ethernet. And it is the key component to getting really high performance out of Ceph. So people are doing a lot with like turbocharging Ceph. They're, they're taking this InfiniBand technology and they're putting it into kind of the scale out storage. But it's also, if you guys are looking at NVMe drives, anybody looking at NVMe drives? So there's, um, there's a standard for kind of uh, networking NVMe drives. It's called NVMe over fabrics. And so if you're selling servers, I'll tell you what, you're almost definitely selling storage to your customers. And you're going to want to sell high-speed storage that you can connect the two. And if you've got a network that looks like this and you've got overlays, you want that tunneling technology, the VXLAN technology, to work with your high-speed storage technology. So the two should be hand-in-hand. -hand. So those are all things that you should be demanding from your uh, EVPN physical network. Okay, so now let's talk about marrying these two together. Right, so why would you, why would you do that? Well, so if you can imagine, you sell a lot of virtual machines and now you're starting to sell bare metal servers. You sell them to a customer that may buy both. In fact, it's very likely they will have some workloads they want on virtual machines and they have some workloads they want on bare metal servers. That's why you're selling them. What they do have though is an expectation that the two devices that they've, or maybe hundreds of devices that they've kind of leased from you can connect to each other over your network not their network. They don't, have to, they don't want to go out and have to route out through the internet to go from a bare metal server to a, a, a virtual machine. And so we're going to talk about a few different ways of, of doing this. Uh, first is uh, what uh, a friend uh, coined is like cloud done wrong. Right? So if you kind of think about uh, what I have over here is a VM cloud and I've got a bare metal cloud over there. And the easy way, and, and this isn't wrong, right? If you have a small network if you have a small deployment, you can just use servers. You can load, put a network node software on there, use DBDK, and you're gonna get, I don't know, tens of gigabits per second of throughput. All right, you're throwing away some servers to do that, but if you're looking at a, a larger scale way of doing that, you don't use servers there as the gateway. You use switches, right, so you use switches. And so that previous one, I don't have the name, but it's an actual customer that has deployed this exact scenario, and we've just removed their name to protect the innocent. This next uh, design is another customer, only they've done a different thing. So they're using an overlay controller. I won't tell you which one, but it, it rhymes with uh, MSX. And so they've got a controller that uh, they're not using necessarily OpenStack over here, uh, but they're using uh, like an EVPN cloud over there. And so what they're doing is they're using switches, but they're using the switches just like um, uh, VMware supports the traditional hardware VTEP. In fact, up until recently, if you said hardware VTEP, you weren't thinking EVP, EVPN. You were thinking, hey, I've got a, a hardware like bridging gateway to my software-defined network. 
And so this is one way of doing it. But let's say you said, hey, listen, I, this is an OpenStack shop. How do we, how do, we do this with um, Neutron? So Neutron has um, uh, some built-in functionality called L2 Gateway. It works very similar to the previous example. If you look at the previous example, what you do, you've got like this trusted path between the controller and the switch, and the switches, VLANs and VXLAN, it's all controlled using OVSDB. And then you have um, tunnels that actually go from the hardware VTAP to the software VTAP. OpenStack has something very similar, they call it L2 Gateway, or L2, yeah, L2 Gateway. And the same idea is that you've got these L2 agents running on the servers, you've got um, OVSDB is the control plane that lets the kind of neutron, your network engine, kind of a controller control the, um, the switches. And I don't show in this, in this uh, design, but if you can imagine, I've shown these switches to be kind of distinct. These are, I've called them my, my kind of VM cloud spine. And over there I've got my um, EVPN spine. Now if I was better at PowerPoint, you'd see this thing merge together and it'd be a thing of beauty. But you can imagine these spines actually could be the exact same spines. There's no reason that the, nothing special about the VM cloud spines and the bare metal cloud spines. Right? What really matters is, are the top of rack switches doing the hardware VTAP, or are the, um, the servers doing the VTAP? And in fact, the same one switch at a, at, a, at a tour could kind of do both. It could say, hey, I've got some bare metal. And so what you end up having is VNIs. So that's where the, there really is a difference. I've got the VNIs for the VM cloud that are in a different kind of range than the VNIs for the EVPN cloud. And they're like ships in a night passing over the same physical infrastructure, same spine network. Uh, and so you're not really building two physical networks, although you do still, at least today, have this idea of a gateway that goes from the one set of VNIs to another set of VNIs. Now, there's actually work going on in uh, OpenStack to make it even uh, more tight so that you have EVPN talking more natively to kind of Neutron and uh, exchanging some of those things. All right. So, I included um, some links to, you know, because I think these presentations are available uh, later. But um, so that OpenStack L2 gateway, this is well documented in a lot of places, but if you wanted to configure it on, uh, say, a Mellanox switch, we've got a link on how you would do that. I've also got links on how to install the, the kind of the Mellanox plugin um, as well as um, eVPN. So Cumulus Linux is our um, uh, premier operating system that we run on our hardware, and that's how we get our EVPN support. It's through that, um, that relationship. Um, we, we feel we've got the best um, hardware for doing VXLAN. They have the best software for VXLAN, so it's like, you know, um, Reese's peanut butter cups. I don't know, you guys have those in Australia? Right, so it's like chocolate and peanut butter. They, some places, some people like that. All right, uh, lastly, because I'm getting the hook here, um, what if you want to play with this? What if you want to play with a bare metal cloud and you didn't want to spend a, a million dollars on Cisco kit? We have a, like a POC in a box kind of thing. It's got four switches, it's got these little switches. I know it's not obvious, but they're little half width switches. So two 100 gigabit ethernet you know, switches, each one with 16 ports and they fit side by side in a single rack unit. And uh, you, know, you can use breakout cables and you, each one will support like up to 64 ports. Uh, but the idea is that this thing is all set up and pre-configured for eVPN. Not really pre-configured, I say that. I have an Ansible playbook that you get to do ZTP on these. So you get the switches, they've got Cumulus preloaded on it, but the ZTP stuff, we give you the files so that you can do it uh, yourself. And it comes with cables and NICs and whole whole set of, uh, set of things here. But, and with that, I think I'm, uh, I'm done. Right. right on time. Thank you. Thank you.